Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic. Episode 194. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulation and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. This episode may seem a bit depressing to some of you. However, it's my hope and prayer that you'll find it one of love, hope, and joy. Remember when I ran commercials about ERTC and how parishes and Catholic-owned businesses could get a tax rebate if they were at least partially shut down during COVID and had five or more W-2 employees? Well, a parish decided to check that out the other day. The CPA firm I work with is doing the paperwork now, but it looks like this parish might get a $425,000 rebate. Wouldn't that be worth a few minutes of your time? If you own a business or pastor a parish, have at least five W-2 employees, and were at least partially shut down during the COVID lockdowns, click on the link in my show notes that says ERTC Recovery, I Want My Money, under the miscellaneous heading near the bottom of the provided links to see if you qualify. It's free, so check it out. I want to begin this episode by talking about purgatory. I'm amazed how many Catholics I run across who think the church doesn't teach the reality of purgatory anymore. Just because you don't hear priests preaching about purgatory doesn't mean that it's no longer believed by the church. However, I understand why so many Catholics think that way. After all, the majority of you haven't even been taught about the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, which is the very heart of our faith. A lack of modern belief in purgatory speaks to a problem greater than mere neglect or malfeasance in teaching by the shepherds of the Catholic Church, though. 
In the minds and hearts of many Catholics, Catholic theology has been replaced by Protestant heresies. Again, I get it. If you don't hear it preached, there's no reason to believe it. Worse, in the case of the afterlife, you hear heresy far more than orthodoxy anyway. When it comes to this particular subject, the heresy accepted and believed by a majority of Catholics is that everyone goes to heaven when they die. They think this way because the feel-good and so-called positive thinking world promotes this feckless notion. However, this thinking is far from positive. It's actually cruel and hateful because it denies truths that affect where you and I will ultimately spend eternity. After death, there are no second chances. You're either judged worthy of life forever with God in heaven, or he'll judge you to spend eternity forever with Satan and the demons in damnation. There's no such thing as God simply saying something stupid such as, I'm okay, you're okay. Jesus' own words in sacred scripture and the constant 2,000-year teaching of the church are crystal clear on this we ultimately either end up in heaven or hell. And the unfortunate reality is that the vast majority of souls will end up in hell, according to Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. It's also unfortunate that most of us haven't achieved perfection by the time we die, which is necessary to enter heaven according to Revelation 21:27. But in his mercy, God has given us a means of paying for our forgiven mortal sins and our unforgiven venial sin. You see, God will forgive all sin when it's confessed by a truly repentant soul and absolved by a priest, but just because God forgives doesn't mean he forgets. A price must be paid in justice for every sin, even the tiniest venial sin, regardless of the circumstances. If you don't believe that, just ask King David. You've probably heard of David and Bathsheba, but I doubt that most of you have ever read the story in Second Samuel 11 and 12. Bathsheba was married to a man named Uriah. David had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. She became pregnant. So David sent Uriah to the front line in a war with the Ammonites, and the enemy killed Uriah to cover up his sin. In other words, David had him murdered. David later repented of his sin. God sent the prophet Nathan to David with a message. Nathan acknowledged that God had forgiven David's sin, but said, Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall surely die. Every sin we commit has to be paid for, whether it's forgiven or not. God's mercy is perfect, but so is his justice. There are only two possible outcomes when we sin, so far as the debt we owe for them. We must either pay for our forgiven mortal sin and venial sins in this life, or we pay for them in purgatory. Of course, unforgiven mortal sin is paid for in hell. Unless you do sufficient penance in this life for your venial sin and forgiven mortal sin, you'll finish paying for them by suffering in purgatory until you're made perfectly clean and worthy of heaven. I've been giving a lot of personal thought to this lately. A friend of mine is dying in the hospital, and may even be dead by the time this episode comes out. I love my friend, and I think about how much better of a Catholic he is than me. Because we're close, I also know that his soul will get most of its perfection in purgatory, because he's not the sort of man who does great penances in life. Thinking about my friend has made me reflect on myself. I've been a Catholic for 33 years, as long as Jesus lived on the earth. Prior to my conversion, I lived a horribly wicked life. I left a trail of ruined and hate-filled souls behind me. I'm the one who ruined them. I'm the one who filled them with hate. The sins I'd committed were certainly forgiven at my baptism, but a price still has to be paid for those forgiven sins, as well as the ones committed and forgiven after baptism. 
I've never been really good at performing voluntary penances, so in God's efforts to save my soul, he's permitted virtually every day of my life to be a penance the last 33 years. Offering up penances he permits in my life is actually easier for me than to think up penances of my own. For 33 years, I've offered up every day of my pitiful existence. It's been so bad, the faithless people I know often ask me why I don't just eat a bullet and get it over with. Faithful people who know me don't understand me. They think that with all the evangelization, catechizing, and good works I've done, that I must certainly be held in high esteem by God, so surely he'll grant me a little relief if I ask. I don't ask for relief, though. I know God holds me in high esteem, which is why he permits so many penances to come into my life. Rather than complain about them, I see them for the opportunity that they are. When a new penance comes along, or when a current penance becomes more difficult, I simply offer them back to God as a gift in payment for my sins and the sins of the world. Then to my wondering friends, I simply smile and say, Just another thorn. Just another thorn. Over the last several years, my penances have grown much harder. This tells me that I'm nearing the time when I have to stand before him in judgment. Let me make one thing about my attitude perfectly clear, and it's an attitude all of you six-pack warriors should adopt. I have no fear of death whatsoever. I've stared death in the face more times than I can count, and each time death has blinked. I'm still here. So I don't fear death, but I know that I can't beat him in the end. Death will eventually win. Facing him before and knowing that it'll eventually win, I have no fear of him at all. What I do fear, what terrifies me, is what happens immediately after death wins. People seem to have always admired me for the evangelistic work I've done trying to save souls. While I want the good that comes from this because saving souls is always a good thing, I must admit to being a little mercenary too. In James 5.20, the apostle writes, My brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I'm counting on that. I'm just about the worst Catholic I know. I can say that because you don't hear my confessions, and I don't hear yours. So I'm counting on the souls I've saved covering a multitude of my sin. Once again, I'm facing my old familiar adversary, death, and I'm fairly confident that he's going to win this time. The doctor is telling me that my body has become my enemy. Had I not horribly abused it in my youth, it might not be rebelling now. But the simple fact of the matter is, my entire anatomical system is shutting down gradually. The doctor says that one day I'll simply collapse here at home and die. It could be a few weeks or months. It could even be a few years. The medical professionals are doing everything medical science can do to prolong death's victory over me as long as they can. In the end, death wins. I think it'll be sooner rather than later because I feel my body shutting down. My brother and his wife are coming to see me one last time today. My sister is bringing my mother to see me one last time, and I'll be visiting with them while you're listening to this episode. I've given myself completely to you six-pack warriors. I sit here in front of this microphone or in front of the computer to write for you, even when I'd rather sit and chat with Mrs. Sixpack, who has dementia, or sit in the sun on my back deck. I have a right to give myself to her, or to get a little sun, but I don't. I give myself to you, so now I'm going to ask you to do something for me. The first time that there's no new episode of the Cantankerous Catholic on a Wednesday, you'd probably be right in assuming that death finally had his victory over me. So what I'd like you to do is immediately drop to your knees and pray for my release from purgatory. For those of you in a position to do so, 
I beg you to give the priest a stipend and have a holy mass said for the repose of my soul. I don't want to spend a nanosecond more in purgatory than I have to. The suffering I've had in this life is child's play compared to what I'll face in purgatory. I'm not asking you to adopt me, only that you love me enough to pray me out of purgatory. Please pray for Mrs. Sixpack, too. Here's one final admonition for this episode. Even though most of you are between 18 and 34, your own judgment will come sooner than you expect. When Jesus asks you what you did for him, chances are that your answer is going to be insufficient. You've got to be able to tell him you're doing something. Reach souls, podcast, blog, join church militant resistance, protest in front of the bishop's residence. Do something. You might want to sit down for this one. I'm going to stop asking you for gifts to support this show and begin asking you to help me get more listeners to the Cantankerous Catholic. It won't cost you anything except a few minutes of your time. The more reviews the Cantankerous Catholic gets, the more often it's displayed by the podcast aggregators when people are looking for new podcasts. Occasionally, this might cause the Cantankerous Catholic to get attention from Podcast Magazine, the industry's trade magazine. So click on the link in my show notes that says, Rank and Review the Cantankerous Catholic so more Catholics can join us. Then write a short review doesn't cost you anything and it doesn't make me anything. It just gets more listeners for the Cantankerous Catholic and makes the USCCB live it. That's a good thing. It's time for the Sacred Heart Wins with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Each week, His Excellency answers your toughest questions about the Catholic faith, the problems in the church, spiritual questions, catechetical topics, or anything else you want to know. If you have a question, just email it to joe at cantankerouscatholic.com. Now here's Bishop Strickland and Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy. Your Excellency, thank you for being on the Sacred Heart Wins again. Thank you, Joe. Okay, our question today is from someone who claims to be anonymous. And it's rather a long question, actually multifaceted question. So I'll try to read it slowly so everyone can get it. Your Excellency, in March of 2020, you posted an article about the Lepanto Institute's report showing CRS-produced documents that promote condom use. In your tweet, you said, if what Lepanto says is accurate, then we should call for a thorough investigation of CRS. Since then, Lepanto has published five additional reports, each more damning than the previous one. That was two years ago, and so far, CRS and the USCCB have refused to address these reports. Have the bishops investigated these reports? Have they even discussed them? If so, what is being done? If not, what can we do to get CRS and the bishops to take these reports? seriously and respond to them. Well, thanks, Joe. Uh, Anonymous has lots of questions there. (laughs) And all I can do is respond as one bishop. Um, And I took it seriously enough that we're no longer taking up the collection for CRS in the Diocese of Tyler. We are definitely, absolutely Caring for the poor and be even beyond the borders of our diocese is important. So we're doing that. But I haven't gotten satisfactory answers myself to questions. And I really don't know if there's been any investigation. I haven't seen any report. But really, each individual bishop has the authority to make those decisions themselves uh, about what collections are taken up in the diocese and the individual Catholics, absolutely one of the the very basic elements of of how we use resources is the intention of the donor. So if you 
see have questions and your diocese still takes up collections that are questionable to you i encourage you to um to not contribute not to say well i'm not going to be generous to those in need to look for other ways but if if you see corruption in that until we get better answers that to me is the best approach and that's the approach i've taken as a local bishop um for whatever reasons, uh, there haven't been satisfactory answers that I've seen published to the challenges that come forward. And I think it kind of goes back to a question we answered um, earlier in another show that, you know, there is, there are, there's a spectrum of how these things are approached within the church. Uh, should there be? I believe no. The answer, I mean, there's one gospel, one faith, one Lord, one Amen. baptism, but there is a spectrum. And I think the best thing we can do is to be faithful ourselves and to challenge each individual parish and diocese to be as faithful as we can. To if if an individual that's listening has questions, ask their pastor and ask ultimately, I mean, go up the chain of command and talk to their pastor. Maybe they'll get some answers from their local pastor that will help. But if not, then then certainly they have a right to ask their bishop what their attitude is with some of these collections that we just have to acknowledge that there are people in the church. I mean, I just saw, again, keeping it anonymous, but I saw a, a, a woman religious, a nun being quoted that was basically saying things they were contrary to church teaching. Um, that happens. That's a reality. And so I know it's frustrating, but to go back to, I'm giving a long answer to a long question, <laughs> but um, to go back to that, to basically make our own decisions. And as a bishop, I've got to make decisions for the Diocese of Tyler. I have no authority anywhere else. I don't want any, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we've got to, do our best to be faithful and in charity, call others to fidelity and um, do our best to get answers to the questions that we have. But I have limited ability to get answers to questions, as I'm sure the anonymous caller does. So we just have to be faithful. And when we don't get adequate answers, like anything else we do in life, if, if you're going to purchase something or make a donation, and be, people aren't answering the questions you may have, then vote with your dollars. Make a different choice about how you're going to support works of, of charitable efforts if you're not getting the answers you need. Very thorough answer, Excellency. Thank you. We'll see you next week, okay? Thanks, Joe. Everyone searches the Internet to solve problems or fill needs they have. For many of you, I've already done the heavy lifting. Discounting the evil things search for online, people generally search for things that tell them how to make money online, health and wellness products, and trading and investing. Some are interested in having their own podcast. I've got your back on these things. Visit cantankerouscatholic.com. Go to the episodes page, then click on the title of this episode. Below the podcast player, you'll see my show notes. I've already listed products and services in various groupings. Check them out. You can help yourself and this apostolate at the same time because if you like what you see and purchase the products or services, this apostolate will get a small commission. Check out those links today. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack.
One day when she was scarcely five years old, St. Jane de Chantel was playing in her father's study while a discussion was going on between her father and a Protestant nobleman who had come to visit him. The Protestant remarked that what pleased him most in the Reformed religion was the denial of the real presence of Jesus in the Most Blessed Sacrament. Hearing him say this, the child couldn't restrain herself. She went to the nobleman and, looking at him indignantly, said, My Lord, you must believe that Jesus Christ is in the Blessed Sacrament because he said it. If you don't believe, you make him a liar. Astonished by the child's tone, the nobleman began to dispute the question with her. Her answers were both surprising and uncomfortable, so he offered her some candy to end the discussion. Jane took the candy in her apron without touching it, ran to the fireplace, and threw it into the fire. Then she turned to the nobleman and said, See, my lord, how heretics will burn in the fire of hell because they do not believe what Jesus Christ has said. On another day, the same nobleman was again discussing the Reformed religion in the Protestant's parlor when the child approached him and said, My lord, if you had blamed the king for telling a lie, my father would have you hanged. Then, pointing to the statues of Saints Peter and Paul, she continued, But since you have blamed our Lord of telling a lie, these presidents will have you hang. When Protestantism first began in 1517, we did indeed refer to them as heretics, because they most certainly were. That was the evil of the Protestant revolt. They knew they were denying the truths of the Catholic Church, as passed down to us by Jesus Christ and the Apostles. Today, however, we don't consider them heretics because the vast majority of them not only don't know the truths handed down by Christ, but they don't even know the origins of their own individual denominations. In order to be a heretic, one must know that one is denying the truths established and proclaimed by Jesus Christ and the apostles he taught and charged with teaching them to the world. There are over 42,000 individual Christian religions today just in the United States. No two agree on everything. If they did, there would be no reason for their existence. But there is one thing they all agree on universally, and that is that the Bible is the sole rule of faith. This is yet another heresy brought about by Martin Luther called Sola Scriptura, and it was condemned officially by the Council of Trent and reaffirmed by the Councils of Vatican I and Vatican II. Sola Scriptura is the claim that all truth is found in sacred scripture and nowhere else, that everything one needs to have the fullness of truth and to find the road to heaven is in the Bible. The Bible itself denies it's the sole source of divine revelation. John tells us that everything Jesus taught was not committed to writing in John 21:25. The Apostle Paul tells Bishop Timothy that what he has heard from Paul is to be passed on to others who are in turn to teach it faithfully, according to 2 Timothy 2.2. Paul also tells the Thessalonians to hold what they have been taught by word of mouth or by letter in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. St. Luke tells us the first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching that they heard through preaching, according to Acts 2.42. And why was the truth transmitted by the apostles orally? because Jesus commanded them to preach the gospel in Mark 16, 15, not committed all to writing. St. Paul clearly understood that he and the other apostles were to teach Jesus' divine revelation in this way, and that Christians were to accept it, according to Romans 10, 17. We might ask, if the Bible is the sole rule of faith, what did Christians do in the early centuries? Not a word of the New Testament was even written until at least 20 years after Jesus' return to the Father, and the New Testament only came into existence by decree of the Council of Carthage in 397. In essence, then, all of Christ's teachings were handed down by word of mouth until 397. 
handing down the sacred truths by word of mouth is called sacred tradition. Tradition, in this sense, has nothing to do with customs, such as how we address the bishop or priestly attire, but rather the transmission of our beliefs that aren't committed to the writings found in the Bible. Tradition was nothing new to the Jews, who made up the totality of the church's earliest body of believers. St. Matthew, who was a Jew before he answered Christ's call, demonstrates to us his own acceptance of tradition. In telling us about Jesus' infancy, Matthew writes, And he went and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. That's found in Matthew 2.23. There are two interesting points to be made from this passage, one building on the next. The first point is that an exhaustive search of the Old Testament won't yield a single prophet who tells that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. It's simply not there. The second point is a key word in Matthew's phrase concerning the prophet. He said it was spoken by the prophet, not written. Every time the gospel speaks of prophecies regarding Christ, the writers tell us it is written by a prophet. This lone passage in Matthew is the only exception. So there are only two possibilities that exist here. The one possibility is that Matthew lied about the prophecy. If he lied, then all of the New Testament is called into question as a lie, and we find ourselves guilty of worshiping a dead Jewish carpenter. The other possibility is that the Jews also had many of the truths of their religion passed down by word of mouth, not committed to writings of the Old Testament. It's obvious that Matthew, as well as the Jews as a whole, believed in what we today call sacred tradition. This sacred tradition, also called apostolic tradition, is the word of God entrusted by Christ and the Holy Spirit to the apostles. The apostles, in turn, handed those sacred truths down to their successors, the Pope and the bishops, in the fullness of purity. The fathers of Vatican II explained it more clearly when they wrote, hence there exists a close connection and communication between sacred tradition and sacred scripture. For both of them, flowing from the same divine wellspring, in a certain way merge into a unity and tend toward the same end. For sacred scripture is the word of God inasmuch as it is consigned to writing under the inspiration of the divine spirit. To the successors of the apostles, sacred tradition hands on in its full purity God's word, which was entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Thus, by the light of the spirit of truth, these successors can in their preaching preserve this word of God faithfully, explain it, and make it more widely known. Therefore, both sacred scripture and sacred tradition are to be accepted and venerated with the same devotion and reverence. This is from Dei Verbum 9. Jesus said it, the apostles passed it down, our pope and bishops are supposed to proclaim it, so this is what we believe and why we believe it. Do you like to write? Would you like to learn to write? What if I told you that anyone can learn to write and build a six-figure income as a result? I'm talking about copywriting. The sales letters you've read, the radio and TV commercials that you hear and see, and virtually everything you see online from asking for donations to selling things was written by a copywriter. And those jobs pay big. The American Writers and Artists Institute, or AWAI, will teach you everything you need to know to be a highly paid copywriter. Then, after you've completed their comprehensive course, AWAI will even help you get your first high-paying client. And this is a perfect career for stay-at-home moms because you can work at your leisure from your internet-connected devices from anywhere in the world. Learn more by clicking the link in my show notes that says American Writers and Artists Institute. Do it today. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. 
A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Ignatius of Loyola. He said, It is not hard to obey when we love the one whom we obey. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. Three gangsters kidnapped a jeweler, murdered him, and took his jewel case to their hideout in the country. They planned to divide the jewel. Two of the men went to the hideout at once, but the youngest gangster was sent to the store to buy some whiskey. While he was gone, one of the older men said, Say, why should we give that kid a third of the jewels? When he comes back, we'll give him the works and share fifty-fifty. Meanwhile, the younger man was thinking, Those two will double-cross me if they can. Why shouldn't I have the whole jewel box to myself and be a rich man? All that's needed is a little poison in the whiskey I'm supposed to bring back. So he bought some poison at a drugstore and put it into the whiskey. Soon after he got into the cottage and put the bottle on the table, one of the gangsters shot him in the head from behind. Then they sat down and divided the jewels while they drank the poison whiskey. In an hour, both were dead. The police found all three bodies, traced the shopkeepers who sold the whiskey and poison, and were able to figure out what happened. People often begrudge others what they can't enjoy themselves, and that's the worst kind of envy. Greed stops at nothing. In this story, it caused four deaths, three greedy gangsters and an honest jeweler. Don't envy others for the nice things they have, which you can't. Rather, thank God for being generous to them. He'll be even more generous to you. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.